So hello, and welcome to this edition of On the Mic with Mike. Uh, first off, a wonderful reception we've been having from everybody, and I love all the feedback you've been giving us. Uh, we're looking forward to getting out to many different places across Canada to have these conversations. It's important for us to hear from you, so thank you very much to do that. Today we've got a real treat for you. Okay, we're going to be uh, having a discussion around First Nations issues, uh, and particularly as they relate to health research. And uh, John DeWer is going to be joining us. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we're going to be heading up to uh, the offices uh, to have a cup of coffee and have a conversation around this. And we're going to explore uh, what it means for us to be really dealing with truth and reconciliation uh, as we move into the research realm and such. So listen, join me, come on in, and we're going to have a cup of coffee and a conversation. Welcome to the First Nations Information Governance Centre today with Dr. Jonathan Dewar. Uh, John, we're going to be talking in just a minute, but first I do want to say thank you uh, for allowing us to be on this traditional lands of the Anishinaabe. All right, I think it's a real honour, so, and joining us today, we're looking forward to this. Uh, as, you know, as we've said in some of these videos, this, videos, this is really about kind of understanding how did you get to where you are. Um, your career has taken an amazing path. Uh, when I have a look at it, right? And I'd, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about that sure. and then how you see how we're going to move things forward. Sure. So maybe let's just start with you introducing yourself and uh, tell us a little about your pathway because it's fascinating. <laughs> sure. Um, so my name is Jonathan Dewar and I'm the executive director here at the First Nations Information yeah. Governance Centre. Uh, the most recent job and what I think is a, a, an interesting career trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so I've been here for about 18 months and um, it's exciting work. I think we're going to loop back to some of the work that I do here with an amazing network of people across the country uh, who really do all the real work. Uh, I, right, you know, right. I, I sign, I sign papers. Okay. Uh, you may be familiar with that kind of role. Very much so. Yeah. Um, so how did I get here? Um, well, I mean, people who have heard me uh, talk about my work um, or have read some of my work, because the story that I tell really is central to the work that I've done, because positionality or that, um, you know, that. Uh, subject positioning um, for me as a researcher is really important. Um, and so most of my positioning starts with a very personal story of uh, how I came to be interested in First Nations issues in particular, but Indigenous issues uh, broadly as well in this country and internationally. So I grew up, uh, you, know, I, you know, knowing that my maternal grandmother uh, was uh, connected to a First Nations community uh, through her father, my great grandfather. Uh, that's the community of Wendage in Quebec, the Huron One Dot Nation. Um, but my grandmother uh, and her siblings, you know, were a product of their time, and so the connection to culture and community had been severed um, right. in their lifetime. And so my mother and and her sisters didn't grow up with that connection to culture and community. And so I think you'll find that that's very typical um, of a lot of people like me uh, of mixed heritage. Um, you know, they have found their way to these issues. Um, in a very personal way, and then some people have very heartbreaking stories of why that connection to culture and community uh, has been severed. Residential schools, uh, the 60s scoop, um, um, you know, uh, dispossession, displacement, enfranchisement, you know, all of these, all of these issues. Um, and so parts of those uh, are my story as well, and my family's story as well. But I was lucky uh, in my generation that I grew up... Um, with my family openly talking about my great grandfather and how proud we were of him. Um, yes, the stories always started with, you know, he grew up on the res and he left the res and then became successful. But by the time uh, I came around and I'm the youngest of all my cousins, my family talked quite proudly about what he'd accomplished. And so um, he uh, came to work for uh, Louis Saint Laurent, uh, the future really? prime minister. Yeah. He was his driver uh, when he was a lawyer. He later became his personal uh, messenger so back uh, before email, well before email, uh, he delivered uh, he delivered messages uh, for uh, Mr. Saint and then when uh, Louis Saint became prime minister, he went to the hill with him, and he was known as the Indian on the hill. So, so how long ago would that have been? Right? Oh, so my great um, he, my great grandfather retired from that position in 1955, 56 at 70 years old. 
Okay. So that's quite a while ago. But uh, he would have been there then during that time period when a lot of the health policy and such was being formulated and enacted. Yeah, no, I won't make a claim that my grand, my great grandfather was actively involved in decision making. No, understood, but he would have been there during that time. He may have, uh, yeah. may have been at some of those meetings or outside some of those meetings. Yeah. Um, but because he had that role, my family talked very proudly about him. So unlike a lot of families that, uh, um, where uh, the, there was a certain degree of shame uh, about the disconnection from culture and community or not knowing how to connect, uh, I was lucky that in my family, we were proud of that connection. Mm. Now, what it meant was nobody really knew anything. Um, and uh, I became interested as a child, naively, and you know, did all the stereotypical things that young people do when they want to connect to something, whether you are Italian Canadian or Scottish Canadian or French Canadian, right. or in this case, you know, connected uh, to a First Nations in Canada. Um, you have some romantic ideals and you explore those things, which became threads in some of the work that I did do. Um, but uh, I, I explored it through uh, popular culture uh, and later the arts, and in particular literature. And so my academic career was, it started out, I was a literature scholar um, and did a master's degree in creative writing. And I focused my reading interests and my writing interests on explorations of culture right. and community. And again, you know, early on, 25 years ago, I did it, I think, naively. And I came to know many people who helped me along the way. Uh, I made many wonderful discoveries figured out uh, you know, appropriate ways to enter into the discourse right. and be part of a community meaningfully. And then some of those things that I learned did drive me to say, I don't think this is the right path. This academic path that I'm on, I don't mm -hmm. think serves my interest, which includes now an interest in serving uh, community, right. being accountable to community. So when, so how far does that actually go back then in your thinking, right? So a lot of individuals we talk to, uh, this is something that, you know, I, I wasn't even 10 or 11 or 12 yet, and I was beginning to realize this was an area of interest yeah. for me. Uh, um, literature and the arts is almost like a, a fine wine. It's an acquired taste, right? right to, but it sounds like you had an interest really early on in this. How did that come about? Um, well, I mean, you can turn to uh, literature and art more broadly um, is, is a way in. And because I was, uh, I love to write and because I love to read as a right. young person, I'm very fortunate to have parents uh, have parents who were very supportive of that. I think creative works are an avenue for me to explore connection, right. and to explore how uh, artists are using their art to explore that same theme, and then how audiences are drawn to those works, perhaps on similar, on similar journeys. So for me, I was in my mid to late teens when I sort of made that okay. connection. Okay. Um, and uh, I actually went off, uh, I did my freshman year at Dartmouth College in, uh, in New Hampshire, and uh, um, I was enamored with the idea that that was an institution that had originally been built for the education of American Indians. Uh, I had intended to be there in part as a Native Studies scholar. Um, I ended up, circumstances, financial largely, mm. brought me back to Canada. I finished my undergraduate degree in literature here, um, making a conscious effort to try to work Indigenous or Native literature, we, as we called it back in the early 1990s, Native literature into what I was doing. And I did not find um, many avenues for that at the University of Ottawa. What I found was when I went out into the world uh, to conferences and those sorts of things um, or, or book-oriented events, I started to meet this incredibly lively, incredibly thoughtful community of Native and non-Native or Indigenous right. and non-Indigenous scholars working on, working to advance Native literature. And that's where I felt like, okay, this right. is... This is a connection that I can follow and I can learn from people. So, so my, my impression, right, and, and really that's all it is, uh, in, in talking to my colleagues and some of my First Nations colleagues and friends, mm -hmm. but that's a much richer culture now than it would have been 30 years ago, say. Uh, but is the journey any less difficult for a young person now wanting to follow, particularly in the arts, right? Arts, literature, expression, video, whatever it might be in that. Is it any less difficult now than it would have been in your day? Um, so there, there's a very, there's a there's part of that question I can't answer. I can't, I couldn't tell you. First of all, I'm not young anymore. Um, but <laughs> sure. I can imagine that there are many, there are ways that it is easier for young people today right. because there are more avenues. Just look at our Canadian institutions, post-secondary right. institutions, uh, Native studies, Indigenous studies, Aboriginal studies. Um, you know, they have proliferated over the years. So you can, unlike my experience as an undergraduate where uh, I, I couldn't find any courses, I couldn't find the content right. in a more mainstream literature program. 
um, I think the opportunities are much more uh, available now. Now, so it may be easier in some in some ways, but I would never say that uh, someone's personal journey to discovering how they're connected to community is easier. We now have social media. We didn't right. have that when I was young. And so now a lot of these conversations and the very critical uh, perspectives that need to be part of these conversations can happen in an instant on social media. And that can be difficult, I think, for young people. And I know there are some cases where people have been you know, openly criticized, um, and perhaps rightly so. And it is a part of being uh, a member of a community, whether a discrete indigenous community or some larger community of interest, right. um, you have to be open to that criticism. So, there's, so you're raising a really interesting point there, which you've done a couple of times now, right? Community, right? And I think of, certainly for myself, my colleagues who are not indigenous and not First Nations, community is a thing, a concept we struggle with mm -hmm. to really understand for it. So when you're talking about community, whether it be a small local community, a family community, a larger First Nations, indigenous community, or rural community, what are you meaning? Well, so this is this is a part of, you'll, you'll see a lot of people like me, when we do our positionality thing, right. we necessarily use very specific language about how we talk about connection. So I am very proud to say that I'm connected to my grandmother. There's no disputing that. Right. And her connection to a community is real. Right. But her connection to that community is not my connection to the community. Mm -hmm. So I would never make a claim to be a member of that community or a citizen of the right. nation because I am you know, two generations solidly removed from that connection. So um, do you use the language of diaspora? Do you use the language of, uh, right. of mixed identity as opposed to a First Nations identity? I think these are things people have to think through right. and be part of the way they critically position themselves. So for me, I'm comfortable saying I'm a person of mixed heritage, uh, a First Nations heritage, a specific First Nations heritage is right. part of that, but I'm very clear what it means to be connected to community. So when Indigenous folks meet, they ask, hey, where are you from? Um, and the, especially for First Nations folks, they're looking to know which community or communities okay. um, people are um, very tangibly connected to. So it's a geographic? Well, it's uh, it, you are from a nation. You are from a community okay. under that nation context. Okay. You're this community as opposed to that community. Um, but people are also looking to know, um, are you connected as a member? Are you connected as a citizen? Um, and... Uh, um, you know, what that means for the conversation can be, can be different. For researchers, it's very important. Right. Because um, if you are from a discrete community, discrete identifiable community, and you choose to work with your own community, the relationship is very, very different. I think it can be extremely rich, but also fraught with challenges. But if you're not from that community, even if you are First Nations, you're not from there. Okay. It's different, and you need to position yourself differently. You need to think differently, and you need to think where the accountabilities and the authorities are. Okay. So if you're, so so if you're a young person right now, right, thinking about um, this is really awesome, right? I can have an opportunity uh, to have a to become an indigenous scholar, large, right? All that. I don't have to lose my sense of community to do that. Is that what you're telling I me? I hope not. Yeah. I think we've come a long way. Um, I think I think young people, young and old people, right. because there are people there are, there are people on journeys late in life. Right. Um, I, uh, you know, national news in the last several months has been uh, the '60s scoop issue. So those people who were adopted out and are quite late in life in some cases, some friends of mine, um, making those connections. So they're on journeys okay. that I have found myself on uh, a much you know much more profound journey than I found myself on. But they're on those journeys, perhaps in their 40s, 50s, okay. 60s. Um, so young people, yes, um, but it's not all. It's not exclusively young people. But uh, there are there are journeys to figure out what it means to connect, and it can be right. extremely challenging. Um, and I think we have to give people a lot of space for that. Um, but accountability ultimately has to be there at the end of the day. Jonathan, this has been fantastic. I want to thank you so much My pleasure. for sharing. We could go on for another hour or two. Maybe we will someday. Maybe we will. But uh, thanks for sharing all of that with you. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care.